Um, so welcome uh, to our full day for our fall literacy conference. I'm Dana Robertson, uh, the executive director of the Literacy Research Center, um, which some of you saw yesterday when you took the tour down. And if you didn't get a chance to see it yesterday, you will likely get a chance to uh, be down there today at some point. Um, first, I have up here on the screen um, our social media information. Um, with our Facebook page, be sure to like us at the Literacy um, Research Center and Clinic so you can be up to date on the kinds of things that we're working on as well as the different resources that we share through the Facebook page. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter. Um, and then I've been told at the bottom here that we have a conference hashtag. Uh, and I'm actually hoping that a lot of you know more about what that actually means because I don't really know. I just know that we have a conference hashtag. Uh, but I can't tell you how to use it or anything like that. Um, so maybe a friend can tell you if you're not quite sure. Um, so before we get started with our keynote for today, we just have a quick uh, welcome message from Jillian Bello, who's our state superintendent of public instruction. Hi, I'm Jillian Bello. Most of you know me as Wyoming State Superintendent of Public Instruction. What you might not know is that I've spent the majority of my professional career focused on and interested in literacy. I am so excited to send this video message today on day two of UW's Fall Literacy Conference. This conference is such a great opportunity to bring pre-K, elementary, middle school, high school, and post-secondary folks together to talk about not only the importance of literacy, but how literacy incorporates technology, speaking, listening, reading, and writing. As educators, we know that literacy affects all areas of a student's education, and we are all committed to making sure that our students succeed in school and life. It is with that that I am so excited to see pre-K, elementary, middle school, and high school educators from across the state, as well as the University of Wyoming faculty and staff focused for a few days on literacy. It is with honor that I serve alongside the University of Wyoming and K-12 schools to continue to bring great resources to teachers across Wyoming, including the UW Clearinghouse, including the UW Research Center and Clinic focused on literacy, and so many other resources that are available to Wyoming educators. As we focus on today's literacy, we know we can't do so without thinking about technology. Not only the technology that our students use to enhance their learning, but also the technology that educators are expected to and do use to enhance their own professional development around teaching literacy in the classroom. Thank you to the University of Wyoming for making so much technology available, and thank you to the teachers across our state who utilize the technology to make the most of their professional ability to teach literacy every day to our students. And sorry I can't be with you in person today. I can only imagine the wonderful conversations and networking opportunities that you all have. Thank you for attending the UW Fall Literacy Conference, and thank you for your commitment to Wyoming kids. And then, uh, one last housekeeping. Um, I know, uh, for those of you that have just come to the conference this morning, um, please be sure that you register for the conference, and the registration is in the Education Annex building where most of the breakout sessions uh, will be right as you enter into the front door. So if you haven't registered yet, please be sure to do so. Uh, you'll pick up the bag that's provided for you um, with different items inside, as well as your name tag, and it keeps us abreast of um, the registration numbers for the conference. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, for those who were here last night, uh, she was part of our panel. Um, but Dr. Jeannie Parator is a professor of education uh, at Boston University. Um, and a coordinator of the reading education, literacy education programs there, um, where she also directs the uh, university clinic at that site. Um, in addition to that, she has spent um, 
several decades now studying uh, family literacy through an intergenerational literacy uh, project uh, in Chelsea, and um, is a former classroom teacher, reading specialist, and Title I director. Um, but most importantly, uh, at least in my mind, she's been my academic mother since 2006 because I was, she was my major advisor as I worked through my program to finish my degree. Um, so, all those other things are wonderful, but the fact that she was able to get me to where I am today is, is most important to me. She's currently, uh, she has done research in family literacy, classroom grouping practices, struggling readers and writers, um, as well as a host of other things. Um, but most recently, she's been doing work um, partnering with PBS on preparing teachers to use educational uh, media and technology in ways that substantially advance children's opportunities to learn. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of work with PBS. She's one of the co-curriculum directors for Between the Lions, if you've ever watched that award-winning show for PBS. She was one of the curriculum coordinators for that. Um, and numerous awards, um, most noted, notably uh, recently inducted into the Reading Hall of Fame through the International Literacy Association and the Literacy Research Association. Um, so without further ado, I'll welcome Jeannie Paratora. That I'm now it is. So, Dana, thank you. That was fabulous. Dana was um, a real blessing in my life. Here's how we came to know each other. I was looking for some of our teachers for some work I was doing with Annenberg. And, um, and one of my then students referred me to Dana. And I visited him in his classroom, and, and you can actually see. Um, the product of that work is still online at Annenberg's website, learning.org. And I was so impressed with his teaching, I said, you need to come into our graduate program. And that's how that came to be. All right, let me also give you a little bit of background on today's presentation. It's a brand new presentation. I haven't done this one before, so I'm a little nervous. Um, but, I need to tell you a little bit about how I came to this whole thing of transmedia in the classroom. I didn't come. I didn't come to it as a believer. I came to it as a skeptic. I um, I was asked by PBS to join them on this work, and I said, uh, and, and they were focused very specifically on kindergarten, pre-K, K one. And I said, gee, I don't know. I mean, my early childhood colleagues said. BU are really against media in the early grades. I don't know if this is a good idea. Let me do some background reading before I sign on. <laughs> and I read and read and read and read and read. And some of what I read, you're gonna, I mean, I'm going to share with you today. And I came out of it saying to friends, I think I drink Kool-Aid. <laughs> because I am absolutely convinced that it's not just a good thing to do, but it's necessity. So, so that's what um, I'm going to talk to you about. I've, I have four goals for our work together. I'd like to um, define at least the way I'm using transmedia teaching. I'd like to share with you the effects um, of educational, digi digital, um, educational media use on children's learning and development. I'd like to explore ways that we can use it in our classrooms, and I'd like to leave time for problem solving and questioning. So, so those are my, um, those are our, our, I hope, our shared goals. Um, what do we mean by it? When, when I use the term educational media, I'm thinking about the types of media that support curricular based learning around a deliberate plan to teach, and you can say I'm borrowing for others throughout this presentation. And with transmedia teaching, we're focused on teaching the same key concepts across multiple modalities, and, and you can see that there's a whole host of media that, I, that we're including in that definition. 
Um, here's what I learned as I went to the literature to see if this was okay, not only for intermediate grade children and adolescents, but was this okay for our youngest children? Here's what I learned. I learned that three quarters of American, and this is based on 2009, so you can, you can bump that up a little bit by now. Three quarters of American children play computer and video games. Children as young as eight years old spend as much time engaged in media activity as they spend in school. Most parents believe that video games are a positive part of their children's lives. By age three and a half, most children can use the mouse to point and click. They have used a computer by themselves, and they can turn the computer on by themselves. What about the cognitive effects? Classroom computer use for 20 minutes a day increased preschool and visual discrimination skills. Playing the digital games resulted in increases in working memory, mental rotation accuracy. I've learned that that's a really important mathematics skill. Spatial rotation accuracy and visual attention. TV, video, DVD viewing by four and five year olds, year olds is not associated with attention problems regardless of the program content. Now, I, I, I always hate sharing that finding because that doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention to the program content. Right? But this idea that this that, that video makes kids hyperactive or less attentive is just not supported by the evidence. What about its social development? We, we, we hear all the time people saying kids are going to isolate, kids are going to isolate. Here's what we know. Playing computer games, uh, children playing com computer games have shown increased levels of collaboration and communication. And in one of my favorite studies, I read this one over and over again because I was really, I was really surprised by it. Quantity and quality of interactions increased when pairs, of these were kindergarten children, when pairs were at, at a computer doing a puzzle compared to pairs playing with the puzzles on the floor. Amazing finding. What about children's literacy development? This is a literacy conference. Attitude toward literacy, increased <coughs> motivation to read captions, Increased self-confidence and positive emotional connection. Increased interest and engagement over sustained periods. Increased positive disposition toward reading that was sustained into the high school years. Literacy development. Significant positive effects on acquisition of letter knowledge, phonological awareness, word recognition, and story comprehension. A finding by studies uh, by Susan Newman and her colleagues and um, Weinberger found that they actually they found meaningful uh, closing of the achievement gap between uh, children in low income and high income communities. And they found that that media use positively linked with measures of academic achievement 10 years later. So it's the, it, it, it's the uh, sort of corollary to the attitude study. But children don't learn how, how they're taught. Children learn what they're taught. In what, and the types of media we use with them matters. So the benefit of education, the benefits of educational media are not created are, are created not by the media, but by teachers, and how we position the media in their academic lives. <laughs> so here's what we need to think about. We need to think about the type of task we present to children, the cognitive challenge of the task, and the linguistic challenge of the task. Some of them, my work with PBS, some of the work that's been most gratifying for me has been the opportunity to work with the, with the folks who make the games and make the videos before it's in the can and say, use rare, I pick up Captain Snow's term all the time, rare and sophisticated language. 
embed rare and sophisticated language in these games and, and videos, let children hear the language that they wouldn't otherwise hear, very much the language of books. Let's get that into the media. And, and PBS has been wonderfully responsive to this request, as I, I hope you'll hear in some of my examples today. Um, inter interactions with teachers, we need to know when and how much to in intervene. We need to know how and when we talk and how and when we prompt our kids to talk along with us. And we need to have some um, planfulness about our purpose and the outcome of the talk we surround around our media use. And I can't ever get away from the fact that learning is social. And our contexts need to be created for social interaction. So configurations of interactions and activities need to be collaborative and interactive. Now, we talked a little bit about this last night at the panel, but um, teachers matter. Just as there's a digital divide and opportunities for language and, if you will, traditional literacy for our kids, that digital divide is there for media literacy. Here's what we know. We know that high poverty, culturally and linguistically diverse schools have the lowest access and the most ineffective use of technology. In high poverty schools, if kids use technology, they're primarily using it for scaling up. While their counterparts in wealthier communities are using it for knowledge acquisition. We know that low income students use technology, well, I, sorry, I did. Among children ages 0 to 8, 41% of children from families that earn more than $75,000 a year use educational apps, compared to just 16% of children from families earning under $30,000 a year. So we're not bringing it into our classrooms. Once again, the kids who depend on teachers to learn are not well served. So it is a real imperative for us. So what should we do? Now I get to the fun part, the stuff that, that I've been doing um, with PBS and with my colleagues at DU, and, and I'm sharing with you excuse me, for the first time. So some of it has little to do with media at the outside. We start by building on what we know about motivation and engagement. And no one has taught me more about this than the, than the work of John Guthrie, and I think Guthrie spoke at one of these conferences not too long ago. Um, so, so I am... 100% focused on our literacy instruction being aimed squarely at knowledge building. Frankly, just three or four years, days ago, I was not calling this knowledge building, I was calling it knowledge goals. And as I got ready for this conference, I um, went deep into the literature again and, and came across some work by Marlene Scardinalia who talked about knowledge building. And I thought, oh, that's so much better because you never stop knowledge building. Knowledge goals sort of end, but knowledge building goes on and on and on. So I loved that idea. Uh, what do we know about knowledge building? What contributes to it? Complex and engaging multimodal texts, meaningful cognitively challenging tasks, and differentiated teaching. So that's what we're going to focus on those three elements in the next two. 20 or 30 minutes. So, I'm going to start by saying let's put knowledge first. They don't always see this in our classrooms. I don't even always see it in our own clinic, sad to say. We mean to, we intend to, but somehow we get distracted from our mission. So what's our mission? Our mission as elementary and middle and secondary school teachers is for kids to become Deeply knowledgeable about essential topics. That's our mission. And so how do we do this? We make a collective inquiry into a specific topic, and we come to a deeper understanding through interactive questioning, dialogue, and continuing in improvement of ideas. Now, we need literacy goals to support 
that knowledge building. But our literacy goals are in service of knowledge development, not our goal. They're in service of developing knowledge. We need engaging and topically coherent multimodal text set that support knowledge building. Of course, we need the traditional high quality texts. My colleague Laura Jimenez, who's a um, children's and YA lit expert, calls them, calls them sort of um, eloquently book books. She says, we need book books. Um, fiction and nonfiction, picture books and chapter books, range of reading difficulty, culturally diverse. We need all that. But we also need high quality non traditional texts. And those are arranged, digital books, web pages, digital and non-digital games, video, visual images. But we need to understand well as teachers what are the affordances of these different media. How are they allowing us to do what we couldn't do without them? One of the things I, I, I try it's so hard to work with with my students is let's not use media for the sake of it. What is this particular resource doing that I couldn't do if I didn't have an electronic book. I'm going to show you a little bit of that in a minute. What are the constraints? Are there pop-up ads? Are there, what are the constraints and can I minimize those constraints? And so let me show you an example now. Let me see if I can do this right. I have to switch media now and see I'm learning about this. So um, I think I have to go over here and press this. Oh no, I can't press it that way. I have to press it with this. Except. Hey, I'm Chris and I'm Morty. Together, we're the Track Brothers. Can you hear that? Tonight, we're the Back Brothers. I don't know how to turn it louder. <laughs> because we're out looking for the backs. Maybe we can find one sleeping in its dangers. Oh, but Chris, how about this? Line. Whoa, come on. Let's get her off from that cave expedition. Oh yeah. Ever enter a cave or any unless you have years of caving experience. Wow. What an awesome cave. That's starting to wake up. You can tell because he's doing the wake up shiver. When it gets his muscles going, warms up his body, then he'll fly. Little <laughs> bats are so tiny. They're less than half the size of a mouse. Here you go, buddy. Get ready and fly. There he goes. Oh, imagine if we could hang out with these little brown bats, wherever they go, and do whatever they do. Imagine if we could fly like bats and had all their awesome bat powers. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, imagine that you're doing a unit on bats. It's one of the <laughs> next generation science standards. Why would I start with this video? What do kids learn? Anybody? Where bats live. Where bats live? They can actually see one. They can actually see one. They learn the size of, a, of one species. They learn the size of one species. The bats are awesome. The bats are awesome. <laughs> They're not those scary things, right? They're not the pests we imagine them to be sometimes. Yeah, we learn words like roost, right? So it, for me, this is one of those great examples of what goes beyond what I can do as a teacher. I can read to them about this, I can talk to them about this, but going into this case, wow, that really takes me to a place that I couldn't otherwise have done. Now, though I don't want to stop there, I'm going to go to the next piece in my um, 
in my text set, if you will. Now I have to do a little media learning of my own right now. So I'm going to make a switch. And let's see if I can do this right. Okay. So this is an e-text about bats. I'm going to take you into what you see here are the chapters. I want you to also notice the little piece on the right that gives us instructions about how to navigate this e-text, right? But right now I'm just speaking for, you know, time. I'm just going to go right into the first chapter. And again, I want you to take a look at what this does for us that a book book might not do. Chapter 1, Flyers with Fur. It's nearly night. The sky is darkening. Look up. What is flying overhead? Small shadowed shapes zip and dip through the air. Are they birds heading for bed? Look again. These flyers have coats of fur and wings covered in skin. There's not a feather in sight. These nighttime furry flyers are bats. that I could use for guided reading, one by Gail Gibbons, a fabulous informational um, text. One by National Geographic. Um, and Fly Guy, a little easier still with lots of information, very engaging text. And I selected two texts as teacher read-alouds. Stella Luna and the Little Lost Bat, which is a kind of very interesting, I'm trying to turn my children's literature colleagues here to tell me whether I should term that an informational narrative or I'm not sure how to title that book, but you are going to put it in. It's, it's mostly information with a little bit of narrative thrown in. So those, the, those are the books I selected for my traditional texts. But then I wanted uh, my kids to be exposed to and learn about online reading. So I found a range of re reading, a range of Rick piece. I, I was working with my the students in my assessment class just last week, um, coincidentally, on um, motivation and engagement surveys. And one of the articles they read was, was um, Vicki Gillis's on, on the uh, on a survey she and her colleagues revised for adolescents. And as they reported the data from that they gathered to do this revision, they reported that children, this is that adolescents who often report that they don't read or don't like to read, actually read a lot of magazines. Um, and so having for us finding a magazine for this text set was really important. So we found a range of myth piece on bad myths. So it's a great piece. That, by the way, we can get online. I don't have to ever have a question subscription. I can get it online. And then just sort of Googling about children's sites for bats, we found a, a blog um, on the little brown bat. So those are two of the online pieces we have. But we, again, we could have so much more. We, there's another PBS video that's 
that's this sort of combination of, of a realistic bat and these two characters in the wild crabs family. So there's that um, video, and then there's also on the PBS page for parents um, an at-home activity for building homes for bats with lots of interesting text to read. Doesn't have to be done at home, you can take that activity into the classroom. So when I assembled our whole text set for this unit on bats, it looked like this. We used the video that I showed you for getting ready. We used the ebook, the BAS ebook for community reading. That means we all read it. We did some rereading of it. We talked about it. We wrote a little bit from it about it. Then we had three texts for guided reading. Each one a little bit easier than the one before it. And then we had some explore together time, that learning station time that we all have in our classrooms. But you know, I've argued for years, I've often said there's this article rolling around in my head that I've never written and maybe probably never will write that says something like, you can't call it a learning center if kids aren't learning something. Um, you know, so often our learning centers are just classroom management and, and we need to set them up so kids are really learning. So in our learning center um, for this unit, we have the Rachel Rick piece, the blog, um, and, he, and the Wild Crabs video. And then we have books for teacher read a lot. So that's how our text set um, ended up <clears throat> looking. So that's the start of our work. And then we need to choose meaningful tasks. And that means that what we're asking children to do have to have meaning outside of the classroom. Um, you know, I, I think this idea of learning as social is just fundamental to everything we do. And, and, and of course, this is a new idea. I mean, people have been talking about this for many, 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 many years. Several years ago, we put in the, in the series that we collected video on with Dana, we collected video from a kindergarten teacher. And one of the things she did, I've talked about it so often, um, was this. In her kindergarten classroom, she had a job, a daily job, where um, one of the daily jobs was for kid, for, for the kids who were having a job for the week to write down, literally copy on a piece of paper, the title, title and author of the book they had read the day before in the classroom, the book, the read aloud book in the classroom. Now, on its surface, that's a ridiculous activity. It's rote copying. We could say it's handwriting practice, but it just doesn't seem like a very important activity, right? Except that what Cindy Wilson did was she said, your job is to record the title and author and illustrator of the book we read the day before, and then take that piece of paper outside and post it on our bulletin board in the, in the corridor. So that everybody knows what books we're reading in our classroom, and people can talk to us about them. So she turned that very rote activity into an activity with social import, right? That's part of what we're looking for. When Bridget spoke at the um, during the panel discussion last night about students ending up with a podcast, reading and rereading for fluency, so that they could create a podcast. You get your fluency practice in. We know fluency is important. We know there's a very high correlation between fluency and comprehension. It's not a stupid activity we're doing in our classrooms, but sometimes we're doing it stupidly, right? So finding social purpose for reading and rereading is really important. Fluency is important, but it's not a goal in itself. It needs to support something else we're trying to do that is important in our children's lives. And so I would say that about all of our tasks. When was the last time any one of us, other than in a school task, filled out a worksheet? When did we ever do that? Who knows of a single piece of research that supports answering six questions after reading a selection? It's not there, but we keep holding on to these ideas. So thinking about our tasks and the why of our tasks 
and what our choices of tasks are teaching our students is really, really important. You know, last night there was also some discussion during the panel about, about package reading programs, and so many of us um, have concerns about package reading programs. You know, I, um, in the vein of true confessions, I'm an author on a, on a package reading program. Um, and I don't apologize for it, and here's why. If a package reading program is well developed, and if teachers follow it well, and with their own adaptations, it can be its own form of professional de development. It can provide teachers guidance on what's effective. Now, we all know they're used very badly. But, my own grandson is in a school where they're making it all up as they go along. And these are fabulous teachers, and I respect them in doing so. But as they make it up as they go along, they select resources from the web that are ridiculous. So, you know, my grandson came home. He, he's an incredibly strong reader in third grade, read all of the Narnia Chronicles this summer. And he came home with a worksheet during the second week of school where he had to read a passage on a page, a decontextualized passage on a page, and answer questions, multiple choice. And not only could he not answer the questions that were there, I couldn't answer the questions that were there. So dumping the reading programs isn't the answer. Keeping the reading programs isn't the answer either. <laughs> I mean, we've got to think about this. But the answer, I really think, is in us thinking about the quality of text, thinking about the meaningfulness of tasks, whether you're selecting a task from a program or from a website or from your own head. And then remembering that no matter how well we select these things, some of our kids are probably going to struggle. Some of our kids probably aren't going to be able to do it without our mediation. And so we've got to really think more about differentiation. And I hope we can move beyond the idea that differentiation means changing the text. I differentiate when I choose different books for guided reading. That's one form of differentiation, but that can't be the end of it. So this, we also have to think about how we change, how we teach. So. In at least one model, if I were if I were teaching kids that ebook about bats that I had up a few minutes ago, we would start all together by talking about bats and building a concept map before we started to read to listen to it or read it, and then we probably after we heard it once, split switch into two groups because some of my kids could reread it on their own. I could take that voice help away. Some of my kids could read it on their own. Some of my kids would need help to do it. And then we could come back again together to talk about it. So differentiation, not just by changing the difficulty level of the text, but also by changing the amount of help I give kids as they make their way through different texts and tasks. And I have to think about the conditions that create um, success for children. So if you take a second and look at this slide, I see some of you flipping through your um, handout. I should have said this at the beginning. I told you this was a new presentation. So I sent the handout to Amy on Iron on Monday. Then I kept working on the presentation. <laughs> And so it kept getting changed and changed and changed. I apologize. but. It's the way they work. Um, so I can't tell you what page this is on, but it's probably in there somewhere. Um, if you take a look at the slide that's on the screen, I hope what you'll notice is that there's, is that there's nothing here that you haven't seen before. There's nothing here that you haven't done a million times. There's no new strategy here. But what 
we're working with teachers to do is to choose these very familiar practices strategically. When will reading it aloud give access to this text? For, for what text for which kids? What particular words need to be taught aloud? Excuse me, need to be pre-taught. Which can be left for after the selection? We can't trust our teachers' additions to tell us that. Because our teachers' additions don't know the kids in front of us. We know the kids in front of us. And that's why those teachers' additions can't really give us lesson plans that we can implement with fidelity. Because implementing them with fidelity would mean we completely ignored the needs of the kids in front of us. So those are some of the conditions we use. And then teachers can mediate. I'm trying to decide if I have time to show you this video. I'm going to try it. Um, I won't get all the way through it, but I'm going to show you a teacher mediating. This has nothing to do with media. It's the tenth uh, week of fourth grade, of first grade. A lot of people got excited because it was their favorite story from the last anthology that we had from Too Big, the anthology Too Big. Who was the title of that story? So notice what Valerie has right now is whole Monster class. Monster and the Baby by Virginia Weller and illustrated by Lynn Munsinger. A lot of people like that story. You recognize it from the title. And look at the characters. Are they the same? One, One looks the same? Yes. Um, um, so that the cover reminds me of, um, it, it, it's Halloween monster and monster can't speak. Yes, we have another book, a Halloween mask for monster. The same characters are written by Virginia Weller and pictures by Lynn Monsinger. And monster can't sleep. What I'm going to ask you to do now is to make a prediction about this story. And I want you to notice too, just like we noticed the character in the story, her face and. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to do that. But... I was going to speed it up and let you see the end of it. So what happens here is Valerie starts to put it together, then she takes a small group aside, and she reads the selection with them, Coral reads it, as the other kids read it with a partner. And then they come back again together to, to do it, to get to talk about it. You can see this whole video if you go to learner.org. It's there in its entirety. L-E-A-R-N-E-R.org, that's the Annenberg website. Now, so we can have a teacher step in and mediate, or we can call on media mediate. So take a look at this. I couldn't find a book like this about bats, but take a look at the screen and you notice that button down in the left hand corner, that reading level button? Alright, watch for a minute. And, and. Ants aren't very big. Notice the ants end. aren't very strong. Ants aren't very smart. But ants do amazing and strange things. Let's find out about ants. So you notice this is at the simple level, the least difficult level. These ants are taking care of an insect. The insect is called an aphid. Now I could, Why do the ants do this? I could turn that voiceover on or off. I'm choosing to have it on. But watch what happens if I change this from the from the easiest, or the easy, it doesn't actually come in a range, from the easy to the difficult. The illustration stayed the same, and the text changed, the voiceover goes away, and the key words stay the same. 
So I could take a set of iPads, I could set them all up on this ebook, and I could put, set one set to the easy level and another set to the difficult level. And we'd all be gathering the same knowledge with different degrees of difficulty. I see somebody saying, wow, that's what I said, right? I, and I can't, the issue is maybe Bridget can help us with this. I can't find enough of this quality. I just, I think they're absolutely, I think it's absolutely amazing. So, okay, let me switch back. Okay, so. Looking at my time here, um, I'd love to take you into a few minutes of a classroom to see a teacher putting this together. Um, this is about a four minute, four to five minute video, and it, she's actually getting ready for a math lesson rather than a literacy lesson, but I think all of the principles are the same. So I'm going to ask you to watch this for a few seconds. As you watch it, you jot down a few things that you notice. I'd love to just spend it at 30, 30 seconds afterwards to see what you notice. So this is this is a teacher in Chelsea, Massachusetts. It's a first grade. Today, we're going to think about measurement when we watch an odd squat video. And we're going to see how the odd squat agents use measurement to solve their problems. There's a monster coming to their town and it's going to attack them. It's called a hydrocops. And he's big. And he's coming to attack the town. And the odd squat agents have to find a way of using measurement to defeat the hydrocops. The odd squad agents have a map or a diagram that they're going to use so they can find the weapon to defeat the hydrocops. Now, it's not always going to be easy for them. And they have to really, really keep trying when things start to get hard. That's called perseverance. And that's another useful thing, a useful practice, when measuring to persevere. So who is ready to see the video? We're going to stop it at certain points. I'm going to ask you some questions about being precise and persevering. So keep that in your head when you're watching the video and see how they're measuring length and distance in the video. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi, Brad. It's Friday. Mm -hmm. That way you know that you're measuring really carefully. Whee! <laughs> 48, 49, 50. Here. I want you to talk to your partner about two things. What objects did the odd squad agents use to measure the length or distance to the area they need to dig? And how did they measure that length or distance precisely? <coughs> Tell your partner. You can share with us. Justin? They use the pencil. And how do they use the pencil, pencil to measure precisely? They put the finger here, and they put the pencil, and then they put the, their finger for the end of the pencils. And they kept looking at so they wouldn't have any spaces or gaps. Okay, so she continues watching a minute, talking about it, watching a minute, talking about it. The lesson, the entire part, that part of the lesson takes her about five minutes. To, what did you drop down? What did you notice? <laughs> Turn and talk, right? And, and you know what I noticed about um, Alicia's turn and talk? I noticed the briskness of, of it. It's very focused, it's very brisk. The kids are very productive in it. She turns it back, gets a couple responses, and moves on, right? So brisk pacing is part of an effective lesson. What else? So that was social, right? That, that characteristics of learning is social. She built that in. Anything else? The expectation of the higher the expectation that persevere and precise. She she teaches it, she explains it, and then she says, watch for examples of it. So she puts it into action immediately. So we're using video 
to demonstrate something that she might not otherwise have been able to demonstrate so, so easily or quickly, right? So it's that thing of how it's extending what I could normally do. All right, if we had more time, I'd try to draw more out of you, but, 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 but let, me, let me try to pull it together here and say, um, when I put it all together, for me it looks like this. I start with that, I say the John Guthrie slide for me, that, that um, framework for establishing motivation engagement around knowledge. And then I think about the instructional practices that we all know about, whether we're novice teachers or veteran teachers. We know that we need to identify key learning goals. Those are the literacy goals or the technology goals that are going to support that knowledge building. We know that we have to identify appropriate multimodal text. The multimodality is something that's really important to all of our kids having equity in the classroom. We know that we have to identify skills and strategies and tasks to support multimodal te um, text. So with that bad unit, I built into that unit a word study lesson on the phonogram I-G-H-T, because in the book there's right and light and sight in flight, and I can do a lot like this. So these are first graders, I need to teach them how to read, but I'm going to wrap that word study instruction around my texts. I also wanted them to make inferences as they read these texts, and I also wanted them to learn to compare and contrast, because in one of the texts they end up thinking about, they end up learning about mammals and how bats are like or unlike humans, and how bats are like or unlike birds that aren't mammals. So there's this sort of the building comparison contrast as a strategy. Um, I need to identify conditions for success, and that means thinking about how I'm going to group kids and how I'm going to bring in my teacher or my technology mediation strategies, and all of that's going to contribute to knowledge building. And so in the end, I hope my unit ends up looking something like this. I figure out texts I'm going to use to get ready, and then texts we're going to read, and then texts including classroom talk. Notice that first little, um, those first illustrations over there where the teacher is meeting with, with the group of kids. For me, that's another form of text. Things that they're going to talk, think, play together with. And then in the end, we want them to write and share. I need to tell you, those um, writing samples you're seeing, I pulled right off the web. Um, I searched, it's amazing what you can find, I searched for key resources, uh, kids writing about bats, and I found enough. We have not yet implemented this one. So, um, so that's what we did. That's, that's how I've made sense of this work around multimedia and multimodal texts. And in the end, I come back always to this idea that as teachers, we have incredible power. We have, empowered, we have the power to help kids learn. And we also have the power to prevent that. We do. And we really have to think about that very carefully. And so for me, the decisions I make around texts and around contexts and around tasks are really consequential. Not for every kid. You know, my grandson, he's a little annoyed by that third grade worksheet, but it's not going to stop him from learning and achieving. But for some kids, that's a deal breaker. So we have to think about the kids who depend on teachers to learn. That's a phrase Freddie Heber used many years ago that I appropriated. <laughs> kids who depend on teachers to learn. Those are the kids that first and foremost I go for them to do every day. Thank you. I guess I didn't leave time for questions. Dana and Vicki, should we just move on? 
You'll be around. I will be. I will be. Stop you and chat. Absolutely. Great. Thank you.